Hello, my name is Thomas and welcome to this latest episode of British Culture Albion Never Dies. This episode is called M is for Monarchy. Before I get into any of that, I'd just like to say a huge, huge thank you to everyone who messaged me when I was feeling so sick. Um, yeah, I was feeling very, very ill. I, I tested uh, as it was the holiday season, I was planning to mix with other households, and it turned out I did have COVID. Um, and I've just been slowly recovering, resting up, listening to some of my favourite podcasts, and being very well looked after by my wife, given lots of nice hot cups of tea. Um, and I'm slowly, slowly getting better. Maybe I haven't done quite as much research for this episode as I would normally hope, but I also have lots and lots of topics that are very, very familiar to me. Thank you to the 136 people um, who replied to my question in the Facebook group, Britain, People, Places and Past Times. Uh, the question was, what does M stand for in the alphabet of Britishness? And thank you to everyone who messaged me privately on Instagram. Um, I say, I've, I've, I've been sick, I've been ill, but I've... <laughs> I've kept an appearance of being busy um, because I've appeared on the podcast Quantum of History, um, Fleming versus Film. Uh, Donnie and I talked about the book From Russia with Love, compared it to the movie, and uh, there was part one has come out. I believe part two is coming out very shortly, and we're discussing the the relative benefits and detriments of both, um, and also appeared in uh, the YouTube channel from Taylors with Love, talking about GQ's list of 2020 uh, to best dressed men. Um, those were, of course, recorded before I was sick, so it was lovely to see them come out. Um, so if you want to find me, as I say, you can find me on the podcast Quantum of History, you can find me on YouTube from Taylors with Love. Um, anyway, I just sort of mentioned you can find me out there. And, and I really want to get into it. M is for monarchy. Um, who suggested this? Um, monarch was suggested on Facebook by Khalifa, Klaus, and Instagram's James Bond wardrobe. Monarchy was suggested by Miss Leighton. Um, just check that name, Leighton, L-E-I-G-H-T-O-N. Uh, my name is Crichton, C-R-E-I-G-H-T-O-N. So it's funny uh, that you get Leighton, Dayton, Crichton. Just a, a little quirk of the English language. Um, and also on Facebook, Jane, Sue, Mary, another Sue, and on Instagram, Two Green Thumbs Gaming. If you're interested in classic retro video games, go to Two Green Thumbs Gaming. And N. Slayton, who is, uh, you can find him on YouTube, The Other Guys. Um, which is a very fun little YouTube series looking at, looking at Bond. Anyway. I've often been asked about the Queen because, you know, I've lived abroad a lot. Um, Turkish Cyprus, Saudi Arabia, Oman, China, even when I was in the UK, I was working with international students um, and, in fact, students from over 100 countries. Um, and it's a very common question. What does the Queen do? In fact, I've even had some British people ask me, what does the Queen do? So I had a quick look on the, uh, the official, well, Royal Family website. <laughs> they've, they've, le they've led... In terms of technology, I believe the Queen was one of the very first dot-com billionaires. Uh, millionaires, sorry, millionaires back in the 90s. Um, so, they, of course, they have their own website, they have their own Instagram, they have their own Facebook page. However you want to find them, you can find them. It really goes back to the Queen's father, who was a pioneer in, in radio communication. Um, but you can find it, I'd say. What does the Queen do? And here is their answer. I'll just read it out straight and then give my own take. In a monarchy, a king or queen is head of state. The British monarchy is known as a constitutional monarchy. That means that while the sovereign is head of state, the ability to make and pass legislation resides with an elected parliament. Although the sovereign no longer has a political or executive role, he or she continues to play an important part in the life of the nation. As head of state, the monarch undertakes constitutional and representational duties which have developed over 1,000 years of history. In addition to these state duties, the monarch has a less formal role as head of nation. The sovereign acts as a focus for national identity, unity and pride, gives a sense of stability and continuity, officially recognises success and excellence, and supports the idea of voluntary service. In all these roles, the Queen is supported by members of their immediate family. So that's the official definition, and I think it's a really, it's a really good definition. I think it really shows... Yeah, that she, she's not a political figure. She does speak on political issues from time to time. And, of course, we have the Queen's speech uh, at Christmas. You can find on, again, on YouTube or wherever 
whether it's convenient for you, really. Um, and it's really good, I think, to have somebody who is a unifying figure. So we've had some, well, pretty divisive times lately. I mean, lots of people have been divided over, for example, the pandemic or over Brexit. But here we have somebody who is, as I say, head of state, but somebody who seems wonderful at speaking to all of us and being a single unifying figure. I think that's invaluable, personally. But again, what does the Queen actually do <laughs> day to day? How, how, how does one speak to the whole nation? How does one do this? You can read the court circular. And that's the official record of, of past royal engagements. If you want to know what she, she, did she do yesterday, um, then simply have a look at the court circular. In the last few weeks, she's been pretty busy because this is the, the honours system. So she is giving official titles, official awards uh, to people who've done great things in their community. So it's been widely publicised. A lot of people working on the James Bond team, for example, have been given gongs, as we might call them. <laughs> They've been officially recognised. But the majority of them are people who do great public service. There's always a long list of people being given honours. There's normally one or two kind of famous celebrities and they get all the headlines and so on. Uh, but if you look through the list, it's always interesting to see actually how local it is, how many of them are just people who do great things in their local community. Again, the court circular is a, is a really good place to see what is the Queen's day-to-day -day, or you can see official engagements by Prince Charles, the Princess Royal and so on and so on. Of course, the Queen does also have a role as, um, well, head of the Church of England. Um, so again, just going off the official website, the Sovereign holds the title Defender of the Faith and Supreme Governor of the Church of England. These titles date back to the reign of King Henry VIII, who was initially granted the title Defender of the Faith in 1521 by Pope Leo X. When Henry VIII renounced the spiritual authority of the papacy in 1534, he was proclaimed supreme head on earth of the Church of England. This was repealed by Queen Mary I, but reinstated during the reign of Queen Elizabeth I, who was proclaimed supreme governor of the Church of England. The Queen's relationship with the Church of England was symbolised at the coronation in 1953, when Her Majesty was anointed by the Archbishop of Canterbury and took an oath to maintain and preserve the inviolability of the settlement of the Church of England and the doctrine worship, discipline and government thereof, as by law established in England. So again, the Queen does speak publicly about her faith, um, and as I say, the Christmas message, you know, which I think a lot of, <laughs> a lot of the UK loves to watch, um, and indeed people around the world, it does touch on her Christian faith. She always, she always includes it. <laughs> Right, so, I feel that covers monarchy um, and monarch, but on a kind of related topic, uh, on Instagram, Mr. Easy Smiles and Expensive Watches, a, a good handle which he takes from a Bond quote, um, he suggested that M is for Magna Carta, which of course gets into a really interesting part of English history, um, which I'll be covering soon on my YouTube channel. I'll be uh, doing a little piece on Pontefract Cakes, that's coming up, and I'll be covering some of this, but anyway... I'll cover it now as well. The Magna Carta means Great Charter. Um, so I believe the full name of it is Magna Carta Libertatum. It's the Great Charter of Liberties. Signed by King John of England at Runnymede near Windsor in 1215. First drafted by the Archbishop of Canterbury, Stephen Langton, to make peace between the unpopular king and a group of rebel barons. So bad King John... If you're English, then you'll, you've really been taught this at English History. I remember my history master uh, writing up Magna Fata on the blackboard, and we all laughed because it was an all-boys school, or all little boys, and um, they crossed it out. But Magna Carta, great, you'll now remember it. Every school of boys always does this. <laughs> But it's really a peace settlement. As I say, if you're not from the UK, you've probably still heard of Bad King John because of Robin Hood. So Robin Hood is a, a northern fella who rebels against the king in the south. And there's a lot to the story. Some of them are more fairy tale, and some of them are closer, like Ridley Scott's film includes a lot of the, the real history behind it. Um, but, but the origin really is the series of rebellions that come up and force King John to sign this treaty, giving really rights to the barons, to free men, but of course these days we're all free men, so we all benefit from this. It wasn't originally the case. Now, one of the funny little things about it, 
is that it was not a permanent charter, and in fact it was <laughs> very quickly annulled uh, by the Pope, which led to the First Barons' War. Um, but after his death, after King John's death, the government of his young son, Henry III, reissued the document, slightly changing some of it in an unsuccessful bid to build political support more violence, and so on and so on, and then it was signed again, it was reissued again, so Henry III reissued it, and then his son Edward I repeated the exercise. So, perhaps in itself, it was not so significant, it's the fact that it's then king after king, then signs it and re-signs it, with some changes, with some alterations, but it does... It does go on the basis. It becomes a, well, a charter of basic liberties. The king can't just do whatever he wants. Someone did suggest a little while ago that if you study the last thousand years of English history, a lot of it is really just trying to curtail the power of just one family. Um, the Magna Carta is a very significant part of that. I'm going to stick with the suggestion of uh, Mr. Easy Smiles and Expensive Watches, his, his Instagram handle. That's a really cool one. Um, he also suggested Mary Poppins. Now, Mary Poppins are a series of eight children's books by Australian-British writer P.L. Travers. And, of course, is uh, a movie released in 1964. It was the highest-grossing film of 1964, beating Goldfinger. Um, I must admit... I I don't think I've ever watched this film. I may have seen bits of it. I, I certainly never watched the whole of it. And I haven't read the, uh, the books either. But even I, with my ignorance and with my lack of experience of Mary Poppins, am aware of the horrendous, horrendous accent um, by Dick Van Dyke. I've read that the reason the accent is so appalling is because his accent is, in fact, just as good as his dialogue coach, um, who was trying to get him to do a Cockney accent, which I have to say... I've I've listened to it and I've never actually recognised what it's supposed to be, but apparently his dialogue coach was uh, in fact Irish and wasn't very good at the Cockney accent. So whatever it ends up with, maybe it's Polish or Romanian, I'm not quite sure. But it has become a historically bad movie accent. Um, so that's, that's one of the main things I know about it. Um, I'm kind of curious as as looking up kind of any fun facts about it. There's a movie called Saving Mr. Banks, um, made in 2013, starring Emma Thompson as P.L. Travers, and Tom Hanks as Walt Disney, all about the, the process of trying to turn this book into the movie. And the reason it's called Saving Mr. Banks is because in the books, Mr. Banks is, the, I think, the man who employs Mary Poppins, and he's you know, gruffly loving of his wife and children in a very Edwardian way. But in the film, he was kind of given a much more prominent role as kind of a, a cross man preoccupied with work, and he, and he needs to be reformed and changed. Um, and none of this is ever mentioned in the book, so it seems to be... I don't know, it's one of those interesting things. When you, when you adapt a book to a movie, you have to make changes. Um, they even made a movie about making those changes. Um, actually, I was most interested reading through the trivia... Partly by the fact that the music's by Thomas Newman, who did the Skyfall and Spectre soundtrack, so I might have to have a listen to that. But also that uh, Disney, you know, the filmmakers were initially not making a Disney film, um, but they started to get the attention of Disney. Disney was willing to finance it, and they were very worried about, oh no, is Disney going to, you know, turn Walt Disney into some kind of saint? Um, but they didn't demand any changes except that they couldn't show Walt Disney actively smoking um, because that would affect its rating in the United States um, so apparently you see him stubbing out a cigarette and you see his smoke you hear his smokers cough at some point um, but otherwise they didn't really demand any changes anyway I thought that was interesting and as much as I can say without ever having seen the film or read the books um, I was quite surprised quite a few people on my Facebook group I expected this from my Instagram but I was quite surprised a lot of people in the Facebook group suggested Vice Admiral Sir Miles Nesavi, KCMG. Um, so yeah, M is for Miles Nesavi, uh, and that's thanks to Facebook uh, Fraser, Layla, Tony, and on Instagram uh, Daniel Carroll. Again, on Facebook, uh, I feel people aren't putting out public accounts, so I'm, I'm never giving the full name. I'm not trying to be too, <laughs> not trying to be too friendly there. Um, but on Instagram, people are often putting their their public accounts. Um, often very well worth checking out. So who is, if you're not sure, who is Mr. Uh, Messervy? He is, of course, M from the James Bond books. I believe his name is revealed in the novel uh, On Her Majesty's Secret Service as Miles Messervy, and that's who M 
is. Um, and he's he's an interesting fella. Um, his his name is you know possibly inspires certainly the influence for the name M is for Sir Mansfield George Smith Cumming, who is also KCMG. Now he's a real man. He was the first director of the SAS, the Secret Intelligence Service, in the build-up to the First World War. So the fictitious M gets the M from Mansfield, and perhaps that's why the, there's the M's in the name, Miles Messervy. Um, because, of course, in real life, uh, the, first, the director of Secret Intelligence Service is known as C, which comes from Cummings, <laughs> from Mansfield Cummings. So it's an interesting little reference that uh, Ian Fleming put in. Of course, Ian Fleming had worked for uh, naval intelligence, so all this should be very familiar to him. So I had a little look into uh, Mansfield Smith Cummings. Um, first joined the Royal Navy, underwent training at Dartmouth at the age of 12, and was appointed acting sub-lieutenant in 1878, posted to the HMS, well, I'm going to try and get this name right, uh, Bellerophon <laughs> in 1877. The Victorian era had lots and lots of ships named after uh, Greek Greek characters from mythology, and for the next seven years he served in operations against Malay pirates, um, 1875, um, and then in Egypt, starting in 1875. Sorry. <laughs> I'll take a sip of my tea. Not cutting this out. I'm, st I'm still slightly getting over my, uh, my bout of COVID. Anyway, he's a really interesting fella. Maybe, maybe this would be my recommended rabbit hole. He joined the Royal Navy and underwent tr training at um, Dartmouth from the age of 12 and was appointed acting sub-lieutenant in 1878. Um, he was posted to HMS uh, Bellerophon in 1877 and served for seven years in operations against Malay pirates. I always find it interesting when um, these great figures in history went to Dartmouth because I had my short time there. Um, when I was part of a university or naval unit, as an officer cadet initially, and so I went to Dartmouth and I had my time there doing parade practice, um, navigation practice, having naval uh, well, lectures on things that a naval officer needs to know, um, and basically getting navy brained. Um, and it was a very, you know, it's, a lot of these have become core memories, um, just, just walking down the hill. It was a little harbour where I took uh, a whaling ship out through to the beautiful, beautiful Dartmouth Harbour. Um, these things rarely stay in the mind, so I don't know. They just give me a nice picture. Um, a very happy time for me, or a very, very intense time. Um, so as I say, Sir Mansfield George Smith Cummings, he's the first director of SIS. Um, and he's referred to as C, of course, in... Uh, John Le Carre's books, the head of SS, is referred to as C, and in the movie version of Tinker Tailor Soldier Spy, Control, <laughs> C stands for Control in his books, uh, signs his name using green ink, which Cummings did in real life. So that's interesting um, that Cummings influences uh, Ian Fleming's M and influences Le Carre's C. Um, but if we're drawing those direct parallels between uh, Miles Messervy and Mansfield Cummings, they both have the KCMG, which is the most distinguished order of St. Michael and St. George. Of course, these saints are both patron saints of soldiers, and originally this uh, honour was awarded to those holding commands of a very high position in Mediterranean territories during the Napoleonic Wars, and then it was kind of extended uh, to holders of similar offices in territories of the British Empire. At present, it's awarded to men or women who hold high office or render extraordinary important non-military service in a foreign country um, and can be uh, conferred for important or law service in relation to foreign commonwealth affairs. Um, so again, just, uh, just an interesting thing if, uh, I say, as we draw these parallels between the real uh, Mansfield Cummings and the fictitious Miles Messervy. One of the moderators of the Facebook group I, I keep referring to, uh, Brie Tyke, suggested that M is for Martello Towers. Um, so these are sometimes just known as Martellos, they're small defensive forts that were built across the British Empire during the 19th century, uh, from the time of the French Revolutionary Wars onwards. Most of them are coastal forts. Um, in fact, between 1796 and 1815, uh, 194 towers were built. So they're about 12 metres high, two storeys, uh, often had a garrison of about just one officer and maybe 15 to 25 men. They've got a round structure, thick walls of solid masonry to help make them resistant to cannon fire. 
the height makes them an ideal platform for just a single heavy artillery piece mounted on the flat roof and able to reverse and therefore fire over a complete 360 degree circle so you can see them all around the coast of England, Scotland, Wales and Ireland but you can also see them by visiting any of the following places Antigua and Barbada, Australia, Bermuda, the British Virgin Islands, Canada, Guernsey, India, Indonesia, Italy, Jamaica, Jersey, Malta, Mauritius, Sierra Leone, South Africa, Spain, St. Helena, Sri Lanka, and the United States. So they're very, very distinctive uh, military structures. Just to take a step outside that, I'll just go with one person's long suggestions, which was uh, on Facebook, Kath, suggested M is for miserable weather, monarchy, music, and madness. As in, mad dogs and Englishmen go out in the midday sun. <laughs> I thought that was really cool. So, uh, yeah. A couple of people on uh, Facebook, Joseph and Heather, suggested M is for Margaret Thatcher. Uh, Joseph wrote, I like to stir the pot. On the day that she died, one newspaper referred to her as uh, the woman who saved Britain, and one newspaper referred to her as the woman who destroyed Britain. <laughs> many, many people get very uh, wound up about Margaret Thatcher, even, even today. I had a quick look at the Encyclopedia Britannica, first paragraph, uh, and it says, Margaret Thatcher and full Margaret Hilda Thatcher, Baroness Thatcher of... Uh, Kesteven? <laughs> I haven't heard of this place before. Uh, she was born in 1925 in Grantham, Lincolnshire, in England, and died on the April the 8th, 2013 in London. British Conservative Party politician and Prime Minister, 1790. Women's Europe's first woman Prime Minister, the only British Prime Minister in the 20th century to win three consecutive terms, and at the age, time of her resignation, Britain's longest continuously serving Prime Minister since 1827. She accelerated the evolution of the British economy from statism to liberalism and became, by personality as much of achievement, the most renowned British political leader since Winston Churchill. There we go. I think that's a pretty good, pretty good overall view of her. And, and yeah, she's maybe send me a message. What, what do you think of Margaret Thatcher? I find it fascinating that she still stirs passions in people. As I say, she stopped being Prime Minister in 1990. I've come across people who weren't born um, in the time of Thatcher who hold really, really strong opinions. I've met people who weren't born in a time of her successor um, who have really, really strong opinions about her one way or another. And I just do find that very, very interesting. Um, but she's definitely left her mark. Um, many people would say that whatever you thought of her, she was very, very patriotic. Um, she believed very much in Britain. Um, but I'm curious, what what do you think on this? Uh, send me a message. This is one of two topics in this one where maybe I don't have such strong views myself, but I know a lot of people do, so I'm very, very interested. What do you think of Margaret Thatcher? You can message me on Instagram at Fleming Never Dies, and you can email me at albionneverdies at gmail.com. Um, get in contact. Let me know what, what do you think of Margaret Thatcher. I might start the next episode with that feedback. One lady on uh, Facebook, Debbie, messaged me to say that M is from Manchester, which I might go into a little bit later, and Morven Hills. Um, I was, just happened to be browsing through on BritBox what's what's coming up, and I saw a few new episodes of Country File, and there's one all about the Morven Hills, uh, showing what inspired Tolkien, C.S. Lewis, and Elgar. Of course, I did an episode called Ears for Elgar, with a great composer who used to uh, wander the Morven Hills uh, and then compose wonderful, wonderful music. And of course, C.S. Lewis, uh, who wrote The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe, you know, the kids go through the wardrobe, end up in the magical realm of Narnia, and one of the first things they see are these gas lamps in the middle of uh, a forest. And this this is there in Morven. Um, he used to go walking there with Tolkien. And, and there are these gas lamps uh, along these slightly random, random places. And of course, Tolkien's Middle Earth, many people believe the Shire was really based on the Malvern Hill. So it's, it's quite an inspirational place. Uh, and of course there's Malvern Water. You go to Malvern Wells, uh, then you get this uh, fresh spring water. You can buy it in bottles, um, but I do advise it. It's a lovely place to go for a hike, and uh, I'd say Malvern Wells is a nice, uh, it's a nice place to kind of go along to. You know, when you're walking, you can walk around randomly, but it's nice to have a place to actually go to. So head along to Malvern Wells and have a, have a glass of water there. It's a nice place. Right, I said M. M is for monarchy, and that was overwhelmingly the most popular, but 
actually it was nearly Manners. I think Manners was leading the poll at one point so on Facebook. Uh, Lynn, Sandy, Skeldra, Sue, Pam, and Steve. We've got three likes for this. Uh, Tim, who said Manners maketh man. I quite like the three M's in that. I feel you should get some kind of point for that. <laughs> um, Janice, mild uh, mannered. I find it interesting the UK is renowned for its manners and its customs. Um, of course, all places have manners. Um, I remember when I worked in Saudi Arabia, I went along to see uh, a sheikh and I think he was on the phone as he was, as I came in. So I just kind of stood waiting for him to like do some kind of gesture, like, you know, sit down or wave the hand or something. But I, there's a seat for me, but I was waiting for him to tell me to sit down. Um, as much of, say, certain schools I went to, I feel like even in the Navy, you, you'd be expected the senior officer to say, oh, sit down, sir. Um, but he didn't. He just carried on talking. And he was kind of looking at me weird. And I was looking at him weird. I was looking at him, why aren't you gesturing for me to sit down? And he was kind of looking at me, what... Why are you standing over me? Um, <laughs> because for the Saudis, you know, there's a chair. It's a chair for you. Sit down straight away. You know, just it seems very unfriendly to be standing over somebody. Uh, whilst for me, I, d I don't want to be standing over you, but you haven't told me to sit down. It seems really rude to go in. It's funny when we get those little clash of, of manners. And I've come across lots of people. So I used to work with international students in the UK. Um, and they'd often say, you know, English people are very, very polite. They have good manners, but they're quite cold. You can easily have a nice conversation with a Brit, but it's hard to get really close, which I found very really interesting. People sometimes say the same about Russians. They can seem really cold because they don't want to be emotionally in your face from the first, from the first go. It seems rude. Um, I find that fun, funny. I find that interesting. We do have very different customs. You know, as a, as a travel around the world and work in different places, you, you have to adjust, and it's, uh, it's a funny adjustment. You never know, you never know quite what is going to be the thing, you know? Um, one one good friend suggested it's a funny thing that you travel around the world, and of course Britain had an empire, the biggest empire in the history of humanity, um, and yet most places I've been, they seem to remember us very fondly. Like in Cyprus, you know, we're not the hated imperialists, so generally regarded very, very fondly. Um, Hong Kong, Saudi, lots of places I've been where the British Empire was, they, they regard us well, and someone said... Maybe it's because you're just all so polite about it. You can take over the world, but as long as you're polite, it's all fine. <laughs> so I did find this an interesting one. M's for manners. Maybe M, a couple of people said M is for mate. Elaine and Instagram's 007 Islander suggested mate. Um, mate, as Elaine wrote on Facebook, mate is a very British term and other countries, except for beach resorts, would say manners. <laughs> yeah, we do sometimes uh, seem to lose our manners when we go to hot, sunny places and, and drink too much of the beach. <laughs> I was really interested in uh, M is for Midsummer Murders uh, Valerie and Peter suggested this on Facebook uh, I had a quick Google about this because I haven't watched too many episodes but it turns out there's 22 seasons 129 episodes in total each of them two hours so, well that'll be that's quite a binge isn't it I mean the, I think the early early TV show was based on the detective novels by Caroline uh, Graham I think it had to take on its its own life as it grew to be such a monster um, it's all filmed on location in this beautiful Chilterns area Buckinghamshire and some neighbouring counties Hertfordshire Berkshire Oxfordshire sorry when I've caught it it always looks super super stereotypically English um, and when I've gone down south to these uh, southern shires uh, it does always look like <laughs> it always looks like something from TV uh, that's probably a comment on my own experience um, when my nephew was uh, born my brother was looking for you know a name something traditional but not too trendy you know something not overused and all that and eventually settled on what I think is a fantastic name for my nephew which is Barnaby and so we all thought it was a fantastic name and uh, I was amused that somebody telephoned um, some relatives in France who went, Inspector Barnaby! And I'm like, what? What? Apparently Midsummer Murders, the, the main star is DCI Barnaby. None of us watched this show, so didn't know about this, but apparently it's huge, huge in France. Funny how these terribly English things become popular all over the world. Um, well, at least France. <laughs> On Facebook, uh, Deb suggested M is for moaning. Yeah, Brits, I think a lot of us do enjoy a good moan. <laughs> Try not to moan too much in uh, in this podcast. 
Elizabeth uh, on Facebook suggested M is for manufacturing, um, and I've often been given great kind of manufacturing topics by Kid Bond fan on Instagram, so I really have to mention that. Um, so I had a quick look. What, is manufacturing a big thing in the UK still? It used to be the workshop of the world. Is it still a big thing? So I looked on trade.gov, and they said the UK is currently the ninth largest manufacturing nation in the world. Not bad out of, what, 190-odd nations. Uh, the UK manufacturing currently employs 2.7 million people, contributes 11% to GVA, which is gross value added, um, represents 85% of total exports, and pres- provides 13% of business investment. Pretty impressive stats. Anytime I get statistics, I like to go to the office for national statistics. Um... UK kind of independent government body. Um, they said the total value of UK manufacturing manufacturers' product sales was three hundred and fifty eight point seven billion in twenty twenty, and that's a fall, a fall of ten uh, percent compared to the previous year. Of course, twenty twenty being a, a memorable year in many ways. Um, two divisions saw sales increase in twenty twenty. The manufacture of pharmaceuticals makes sense, and paper and printing products increased marginally. Well, if you're interested in any uh, printing, then I I must recommend a great company called London Sands, and they do printing and media work and all kinds of cool design work. And, uh, yeah, I'm getting nothing out of this. I got no cut. Um, It just happens that the person who runs it is my brother. (laughs) I've I've talked about this before, and uh, I'm Ellis for London, Um, and I've I've referenced this on my Instagram, London Sands. If you're interested in that, check it out, check it out. I had a look through all kinds of interesting uh, statistics, yeah, 66% of UK research and development is in manufacturing, 15% of total business investment. This is according to Make, the manufacturer's organisation. Very good uh, very good average pay as well, much higher than most of the rest of the economy. Uh, 13% higher, in fact. The average salary in manufacturing is, what, £33,500. Yeah, 13% higher than the rest of the economy. It's pretty good. Pretty good. And I had a look, what are, what are we actually manufacturing? Lots of transport, that's especially in aviation. Food and drink is included with uh, manufacturing. I thought that was interesting. Chemicals, yeah, rubber, metals, electronics. Yeah, Britain still seems to be uh, doing pretty well in the old manufacturing. <laughs> on Facebook, Jan uh, referred to May Day. So M is for May Day, 1st of May. Celebration of May Day dates back to the ancient times when Romans celebrated the festival of Flora, the goddess of flowers and spring. In Britain, Celtic people harvested, uh, sorry, celebrated the festival of Beltane on the 1st of May to mark the halfway point between spring and summer. In contrast, the festival of San Main that fell halfway between autumn and winter on November the 1st. I'm getting that information from BBC Country Files, a really cool little webpage on May Day. I was having a look through because I don't think I've personally celebrated May Day very much. Maybe maybe as a child, certainly to go and watch Morris dancing, as Morris dancing is generally associated with um, with May Day. Of course, in the, of the West Midlands, uh, lots of Morris dancers do dress up uh, and put on blackface traditionally, and this is because you had uh, very poor people who were using kind of uh, Morris dancing to, to beg, and they didn't want people knowing who they all were. Um, and that's caused a big fuss recently so they've changed it to kind of green face to represent the kind of ancient deity the green man uh, has led to a lot of mischievous comments on uh, social media saying I-, I represent the green incredible hulk and, and he's offended and some people put on blue paint now and people say i, I represent the smurfs and i'm offended <laughs> i do find these things rather funny <laughs> Anyway, uh, again, I just want to go to a single contributor and who, whose name herself is an M. Morag on Facebook suggested M is for memorials, monuments, the Mall, uh, a big long road in London that leads to Buckingham Palace, uh, Marlebone, Margate, the Millennium Bridge, and Metro Mayors. I just thought there was a good list of M's. I really like them. Again, two, two cool places, the Millennium Bridge, and lots of memorials. That's very true. I mean, I used to... When I lived in West Yorkshire, especially on the weekends, I try to get out to some some new little village, find some new little tea shop, and really the centre of every uh, every one of these little villages was the the War Memorial. And often you'd have a look at all these, uh, especially World War One memorials, when you know brothers used to sign up together and be in the same regiments. And of course, rarely being the first heavily industrialised war, um, you'd have whole regiments being wiped out. So you see, you look on these War Memorials and you see what, you know, five names, all with the same surname. Um, and often similar initials, that might have been a father and son. Um, it's very sad, but I think it's right that these things are, well, memorialised. 
Okay, a couple of people, um, Donna on Facebook and Spies and Ties, suggested either Mersey or Manchester. So the River Mersey is a river in the northwest of England, um, apparently derived from the Anglo-Saxon language and translates as Boundary River. So the river may have been the border between the ancient kingdoms of Mercia and Northumbria. And for centuries it's formed part of the boundary between, say, Lancashire and Cheshire. So... uh, so yeah, you get this river that stretches down. It goes, kind of curves round Manchester, then goes through, say, Warburton, um, past Appleton Thorn, and then goes down to Runcorn, goes past Liverpool and out uh, past New Brighton. I wonder if there's a New Brighton in the United States. I wonder if they have to call it a new New Brighton. Anyway, the River Mersey gives its name to Mersey Beat, uh, as developed from bands from Liverpool, most notably the Beatles. And I was particularly interested. I was, I was just I was having one of my little... Uh, travels through the internet and I discovered that the Mersey is considered sacred by British Hindus and it's worshipped in a similar way to the River Ganges. Uh, this festival of immersion ceremonies held annually on the river with clay figures representing the Hindu Lord Ganesha and the elephant deity riding a mouse which is submerged in the river from a ferry boat. It follows through flowers, pictures and coins into the river. I just thought it was really interesting that the River Mersey in Hinduism is a sacred river. A couple of people on Facebook, Richard and Lynette, suggested M is for Mountbatten. I'm assuming Lord Louis Mountbatten, the British naval officer who oversaw the defeat of the Japanese offensive towards India in World War II and was appointed the last Viceroy of British India, first Governor General of Independent India. Like many aristocrats, he was educated mainly at home until 1914, when he went to the Royal Navy College at Dartmouth. So again, one of my favourite places, being referenced in the in the biography of a great man. He joined the Royal Navy in 1916 and saw action in World War I, and then briefly attended Cambridge University for one year. <laughs> Don't know what happened there. I have to read a bio of him, a proper bio. Anyway, Mountbatten spent the interwar period pursuing his naval career, where he specialised in communications, 1934, received his first command on the destroyer HMS Daring, Ah, no Greek names there. In June 1939, shortly before the outbreak of the war, Mountbatten gained command of a flotilla of destroyers which saw considerable action in the Mediterranean. In 1941, his ship, the HMS Kelly, was sunk by German dive bombers off the coast of Crete. With the loss of more than half the crew, Kelly and her captain were later immortalised in Noel Coward's film, In Which We Serve. That is a tremendous, tremendous film. Um, and quite quite poignant, in which Noel Coward plays well, very much a character based on Lord Louis Mountbatten. Well worth seeing in which we serve. Again, just running through his life, um, he was, Mountbatten was appointed Chief of Combined Operations in 1942 with responsibility for the preparation of the eventual invasion of occupied Europe. Um, he then was transferred to the Southeast Asian Command, uh, working with General William Slim, achieved the defeat of the Japanese invasion towards India and the reconquest of Burma, and received the Japanese surrender at Singapore. He left, of course, the Royal Navy uh, to, uh, to oversee uh, the process of Indian independence, and then in '53 returned to the Royal Navy, becoming commander of the new NATO Mediterranean Command. Um, and then in 1954 was appointed to first Sea Lord, uh, which of course a position held by Churchill, um, and then before that was actually held by Lord Mountbatten's father. He died very sadly uh, in 1979, uh, murdered when IRA terrorists blew up his little boat off the coast of uh, County Sligo in uh, Ireland near his family holiday home. Two of Mountbatten's relations and a 15-year-old local boy were also killed. So a very sad end to a very, very great life. And now something completely different. Uh, M is for Monty Python by F. Facebook's Lynette. Um, actually... It wasn't until I Googled this I realised it first aired in uh, 1969. It's normally referred to as a 70s icon. I suppose that's when Monty Python's Flying Circus really became big. And then, of course, you get the movies The Life of Brian. Uh, of course, the first movie is The Quest for the Holy Grail. Um, I always find it interesting that, that Monty Python was really composed of two teams, kind of the ex-Cambridge Footlights fellas, which is John Cleese, Graham Chapman and Eric Idle, and the ex-Oxford writing partners Michael Palin and Terry Jones. 
Um, and they always found it funny that they could always cast the ex-Cambridge people as, you know, man in authority looking down, and they could often cast the, the, uh, the ex-Oxford people, Palin and Jones, as, uh, you know, little man fighting up against them. Um, and then, of course, you have, uh, man number six, Terry Gillingham, born in Minnesota, but spent his high school and college years in Los Angeles. Uh, he worked as a cartoonist initially, uh, for a magazine that went bankrupt, so he told all his friends in being, uh, transferred to the European wing. There was no European wing. Um, he just went to work on UK TV where he came across um, Eric Idle um, and Terry Jones and Michael Palin and worked with them on a, a show called Do Not Adjust Your Set, uh, which eventually fed into Monty Python. Um, I found it interesting that Terry Gilliam um, kind of worked more behind the scenes as all the animations, a lot of the directing, um, but became a UK citizen in 1968 pronounced his US citizenship in 2006. No idea why. I guess I could Google it a little bit more. Again, I've been doing my best with the uh, dreadful, dreadful cold, whatever it is. Um, oh, I was COVID. But anyway, I found this very interesting to look into. I, I thoroughly enjoy Monty Python. I really enjoy the life of Brian, especially. Um, but I did rewatch uh, The Quest for the Holy Grail a lot better than I remembered it, actually. So that's a a good M. <laughs> Two Green Thumbs Gaming did to suggest M is for Monocle. I don't know, is that a very British thing? Detailed by Q2 uh, suggested Mam. I quite like that. We pronounce it Mom. Ah, yes, it's New Zealand thing. Mam. Mam. Anyway. Bond on the stage suggests M is for Ministry. Uh, I guess especially Ministry of Defence for James Bond. But, oh, here's a, here's a section. Foods. Foods beginning with M. M is for muffins, M is for marmite, M is for marmalade, M is for mushy peas, M is for mince pies, mashed potatoes, Mars bars, mustard, mash, Maltesers, milky bar kid, and meat pies. So many people suggested foods. Thank you very much to, uh, well, Kathleen, Teresa, James, Kay, Moira, Mary, Amanda, Geraldine, Debbie, and... Ladies Who Bond, who I've talked to on this podcast before, and you can find on Instagram and YouTube. What a what a lot of different foods. Um, yeah, I think uh, mushy peas is actually quite a popular one. I guess it's good to have with fish and chips. Uh, I quite like Marmite. Uh, have it every strange foreign place I go to. Always get a jar of Marmite. Perhaps uh, one that is absolutely indisputable is that on Facebook, Mary said that in the alphabet of Britishness, M is for me. <laughs> and yeah, it's for me too. So yeah, I like this. M is for me. And the final one, final, final, final one. This is one that I, I have to admit I didn't really understand. And as I almost discounted it when one person said it, and then the second person said it, and the third, and the fourth, and the fifth. I, I, I didn't really understand this one. So this is the second point where, if you have any ideas on this, please, please do reach out to me on Instagram and, and reach out to me on, on email, if you prefer email. Um, M is for mum, according to uh, Ursula, uh, Jack and Pauline. Uh, according to Sydney, M is for mother. Karen, mother England, okay. And the British writer, Roland uh, Hume, who you can find on YouTube, Instagram. I, I asked him, he's, he's, a, he's a writer, he's clever. He, he, he knows how to phrase these things. I, I said, I really... I don't understand why M should be for mother in the alphabet of Britishness. I've lived in many parts of the world. People love their mothers everywhere I go. Um, but Roland made a really good point. I'm, I'm going to quote him exactly. Ask his permission for this. Roland said, I think Britain has an obsession with matriarchal figures. Bodicea, Elizabeth I, Victoria, Elizabeth II, Margaret Thatcher. Then you think of how Ian Fleming called his mother M. I think there's a uniquely British preoccupation with trying to earn the love of stern mummy figures. I found that really, really interesting. That's something I'd never, ever think about. Um, I thought it was really creative, really interesting. Um, are you one of the people who suggested M is for mother? Send me a message. Like, maybe, maybe you can explain it a little bit more to me. Why is M for mother? Or maybe you'd like to message me about your, your views on Margaret Thatcher. I'm, I'm very, very curious. Why does she provoke such a such a strong reaction um so there we go that is my list of the m's in the alphabet of britishness um i didn't put in uh <laughs> i didn't put in breaks here really because uh 
Oh, because there's a lot of work. I want to go back to bed and have more tea. I've um, been getting over my uh, my bout of COVID, and uh, I'm all right. I'm all right, but I do need a bit more rest. But thank you very much to everybody who messaged me, especially those saying get well soon. Thank you very much for all your ideas. We're halfway through the alphabet of Britishness. It's passed very, very quickly and passed very, very happily, thanks to so many people sending such wonderful suggestions. I've even had a couple of people messaging me say, hey, you're halfway through, time has flown. What's coming up next? What happens when you finish the alphabet of Britishness? And sending a few suggestions for what I might do next as a series if I didn't want to just keep going through the alphabet again and again. So if you, again, have an idea for that, well, if you have an idea for, you know, what is this business of Margaret Thatcher? <laughs> what is this idea about M is for mother? And what should I be doing after the alphabet of Britishness? There's quite a few things where you can help shape this podcast. You can you can help me out. This whole podcast is really about what is Britishness. It's a, it's a bit of a... A bit of a quest, really, to find out what this thing is. I haven't lived in England for so long. I study it from a distance. I've missed out on, on many big, big events. And I, and I do wonder, I say every nation changes. Maybe Britain's changing quite a lot as I'm away. So this is really a, a deep dive, this investigation. So uh, do help me out. It, it, it really does help. What can I say? Thank you very much to everyone. And thank you for downloading this episode. Stay safe. <laughs>